the overall function of neural tissue is is it to orchestrate movement overall or just more broadly orchestrate the cooperation of different parts within an extended multicellular macroscopic maybe macroscopic creature so we need to go back to the uh, biological realm to understand this because the biological realm, in fact, all realms after the biological realm as well, have two critical kind of partitions. One is what we could call uh, visceral. In other words, the metabolism and other stuff happening internally within the cell. And another somatic, which would be the interaction of the outside of the cell wall with the external environment. Now, when animals evolved out of um, uh, biological realm organisms, in, in particular, in out of uh, multicellular, well, not multicellular, but uh, uh, from let's let's take animals. So animals evolved out of protozoa. Uh, so protozoa are single cell eukaryotes. Um, but they would form colonies and those colonies would cling together. And to do that, they used adhesion molecules. So the clinging together um, of cells could happen in two ways. One is that it's cells that have come to be as a, uh, as a result of different mother cells, just to use the not to be sexist, but the mother cells, as it's called in the literature, um, um, or one mother cell that has that generates the same DNA for all of the other cells. So the if you have a uh, a colony made up of cells that are all of the same DNA that is the, the pathway to multicellularity. Now, I'm not gonna try to explain how that happens from single cell to multi-cell, uh, from single cell colonies to multi-cell organisms. It's just, it would take all day. Uh, and it took me like maybe a year to figure it out when I was trying to write about it in that book. Um, so let's just say that protozoa are the base of the, uh, the, multi, the single cell basis of animals. Um, there's a kind of algae that's the single cell basis of plants. And uh, uh, I forget what the uh, kind of uh, amoeba that's the basis of the of fungi. Those are the three kinds of multicellular organisms. So when you go from single cell to multicell, the visceral and somatic functions are carried forward, forward from the biological realm to well, not from the, into plants and fungi, it, they're still biological. Let's, let's go to animals. So when you go from the uh, protozoa to animals, the visceral and somatic functions are carried forward into the first animals, sponges, basically. And the sponges, present day sponges don't have nervous systems, but it's been strongly suggested that they had it at one point but because of their sessile life, they just didn't need it. And so, it, you know, things get ditched all the time in evolution. It's not necessarily working. But the components, the thing that, uh, that the, the genes that allowed them to have a nervous system were passed on to the next level, which were jellyfish-like animals. Uh, and they, in fact, did have a nervous system uh, and still do. So in the genes that are going into from protozoa to, to sponges to jellyfish, what you're doing is hanging on to functions, gene functions that were old and sending them in to, uh, into the future. And some of those get kept and others get discarded. So some of those allowed um, uh, cells to cling together because of the adhesion molecules that colonies use to cling together and which had been used for something else even earlier. So the clinging together allowed neurons 
it had allowed cells to stick together, but then to spread apart a little bit and to, to st have protrusions that come out that would then stick up to the cell, the distal cell, and event and longer and longer protrusions. Um, and also the something that was carried forward was the ability to gen generate electrical sparks uh, in the in the biology of of these single cell organisms. So action potentials first arose in, um, I think it might've, it's either in an early eukaryote or a prokaryote, I'm not sure, but in, in single cell organisms as a means to repair the cell wall if it's damaged. So if a cell has a damaged area of the cell wall, it's at risk of either collapsing from all of the stuff coming out going out of the, the uh, cell membrane or exploding by stuff coming too much coming in and, and making it blow up. So it's very important to repair the cell wall. And if you can have molecules that are, that will generate an electric spark near the injury that can attract nutrients and be used to rebuild the cell wall. So that is believed to be the basis of electrical signaling uh, in organisms, you know, there are many, many organisms have organ that have uh, electrical signaling, but in the nervous in, in animals, again, they co-opted adhesion and electrical signaling to create to start creating a nervous system. And of course, the first nervous systems were uh, div uh, kind of diffuse things. There were neurons all over the place, and they were kind of randomly connected. You know, you touch a jellyfish on one side, and the whole body moves. So they didn't have control over specific functions so much. But as the as organisms evolved uh, from the jellyfish, more complicated forms of interactions took place, so that you could have um, localized responses. So if you touch the body here, that part could withdraw, and not the whole body having to withdraw. Um, but you could also control uh, um, whole body movements and locomotion that way. But the other thing you have to control if you are a multicellular organism is um, the inner functions that keep all of the cells working properly. I mean, each cell has its own homeostasis within the, the neuron itself, right? But you also have to have homeostasis across all of the neurons. So you have this visceral function uh, and feeding, feeding is a visceral function. So multicellular organisms have to take in a lot of uh, nutrients in order to keep the, the engine going. Um, so feeding became a very crucial visceral, uh, visceral function inherited from, you know, these uh, single cell organisms and turned into part of the machinery of the nervous system that allows metabolism to keep the organism alive. And the somatic, the outside somatic interaction with the environment became internalized with neurons controlling different body parts to allow the animal to move externally uh, and in the, the quest to capture uh, food uh, and to avoid danger. So the biological realm passed on these visceral and somatic functions to the neurobiological realm, allowing the biological organism to survive more effectively by having the ability to respond quickly and efficiently and in an organized, complicated way. That was a great story. So I forget what your <laughs> question was, but that was, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the stories of co-opting and evolution are, are so amazing. And I mean, the adhesion molecules, the spark generations for repair. So thanks, thanks so much for sharing those. One, well, I guess there are two lingering questions before we move on. And one is where the, what the big change is in vertebrates and then more particularly what distinguishes, I mean, there are lots of things, but human brain, since this is a story about the, the, the human body, what, di what differentiates human brains from those of other, like our closest relatives? So yeah, I feel I need to put some stuff in between that if if you don't if you don't mind. I don't because mind we, at all. when we go from we need to <laughs> when we go from jellyfish to you know jellyfish are not bilateral organisms. They're 
radio, so to speak. Um, but all, most of the, the animals that we live amongst are radial, left, right, front, back, you know, and so forth, top, bottom. So uh, jellyfish only have a top and a bottom. You know, they're not, they don't have a front and a back, um, or, or left and right. So the, the first organism that had a radio body was a, a, a flatworm that lived about 630 million years ago. And that gave rise to two lines of descent. Uh, also, the flatworm had a, a you know a little nervous had a little concentration of neurons in its head. It had a front and a back, and so the head was there. And so the nervous system went to the head because if, if the worm is trying to get away, the tail will be the first thing that's attacked from a predator coming from behind. And saving the nervous system and its ability to control the whole body, uh, you know, it had a nerve net that went down to the whole body, so he had centralized control over the, the various legs or whatever was going on and ability to move in the world. Uh, and the, the head is up there so the predator can only get the tail. Um, so this flatworm then gave rise to one lineage that became the uh, protosomes, which are all of the invertebrate organisms that, that, uh, that we know and love, octopus and um, you know uh, various kinds of uh, bugs and so forth and bees and all of that. Uh, and then the other line also gave rise to some invertebrates, but these were um, the, the invertebrates that then gave rise to vertebrates. Uh, and those invertebrates that gave rise to the vertebrates are kind of interesting. They were, the, the protostome deuterostome difference is protostomes have the, um, the mouth opens first in the digestive tract and the anus opens last. Whereas in deuterostomes, the anus opens first and then the mouth opens later. So it's an embryological distinction that goes all the way back to that divergence 630 million years ago. Um, the, but it's important because that allows us to see, to see how and why certain things happen in the developing embryo in terms of you know the anus goes first and then the mouth and all that. Uh, but anyway, so the the first vertebrates, of course, were fish, and they uh, the first fish didn't have a, a skeleton; they had a, a, a cartilage skeleton rather than a bony skeleton. Um, and one of the, the, I guess one of the earliest living fishes uh, now is the uh, uh, lamprey. Uh, I visited Sten Grillner in Stockholm, um, who studied lamprey all, all of his life. Uh, and they're really fascinating kind of little creatures. Um, they survived many, many, many things. I mean, they're kind of like the bacteria of vertebrates. Uh, bacteria you know, have been around the whole time and probably will always be around. We're going to kill ourselves off. Bacteria will survive. Maybe the lamprey will too, because they've managed to go for a long time. So the lamprey were, the, were an early fish and then came bony fish later, the kind of fish we normally buy in the supermarket and stuff. Um, so they have, what we're, what we're dealing with here are organisms at this point that are all neurobiological realm uh, organisms. They can, they have reflexes, they have uh, motor programs that control complicated behaviors, motor patterns. Uh, they can learn habits and control them. Their brain has essentially every major part that the human brain later has, um, not in terms of details, but in terms of the forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. Uh, the, the lamprey has a basal ganglia, it has an amygdala, it has a, uh, uh, a neocortex, it has all of the major components. They're, they're pretty primitive, but you know, uh, this is all based on genetic analyses of what the, you know, the genetic uh, kind of foundation of all of these structures. Uh, and you can find the genes for the amygdala and cortex and all that, uh, and hypothalamus, and basal ganglia. So the part of the basal ganglia that's there, though, is relatively primitive. And what it can do is learn a habit, a stimulus response habit, by the release of dopamine onto sensory motor cells that are converging in the basal ganglia and then coming back to the sensory motor cortex of the cortex um, and 
allow the animal to form a stimulus response habit. So when the sensory system sees the thing that it has been conditioned, uh, the animal will automatically produce that reaction to that stimulus. So um, <clears throat> goal-directed behavior, though, takes a little while longer to, to come in. Um, it seems that that probably did not happen uh, in the lion going towards humans until uh, the arrival of mammals. So in mammals, uh, we know from a lot of work that uh, they can learn goal-directed behaviors, uh, which requires not just a stimulus and not just the release of dopamine, uh, but it requires a more complicated set of, of computations. And for that, at the, the ability to form the goal-directed behaviors involved an expansion of the basal ganglia to like not just the reptilian part, but now a new part that could do, you know, they still have the reptilian habit system, all mammals do, but evolution then adds onto that, but you know, it's kind of like a, an expansion. It's like the biological realm expands and the neurobiological, the habit system expands to allow the goal-directed system to uh, evolve step by step. Of course, it didn't just happen. There's like lots and lots of steps that went from habits to goal directed behavior, but eventually it worked out in early mammals and that was passed on to other mammals and on down the line. So we have behaviors that be are beginning to be more complicated. They involve the holding of information on, in mind about the last state of a reinforcer, not uh, in other words, the present value of the reinforcer, rather than a whole, rather than the uh, 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 that that doesn't cause the response to be released, it then just enables the response to be released in the presence of that stimulus. But decisions have to be made about you know what to do and how to do it. So Bernard Bailey and and uh, Anthony Dickinson at Cambridge worked out all these differences between habits and goal-directed behaviors. You know, Dickinson early on said that if you look at a habit, or if you see an animal, let's say a rodent, uh, performing a, a, an instrumental behavior, you can't tell if that's a habit or a goal-directed behavior from observation alone, because they look exactly the same. The only way to know what's going on is to perform very sophisticated experiments where you devalue the reinforcer. So the main difference between the hab the main difference between a habit and a goal directed behavior is that um, if the animal learned a habit, then it's uh, it is uh, it will respond regardless of whether the reinforcer is still valuable to it. But if the animal has learned a goal-directed behavior, it will no longer respond to the stimulus um, uh, because it is no longer valuable to it. And the way those values are inserted is by giving drugs that make the animal sick. The key in the goal-directed thing is though, the, it's not like the animal's not made sick right afterwards. It's made sick some hours left afterwards, maybe four or five hours. And so the pairing of the, the nausea from being sick with the stimulus is something that is not an immediate stimulus, but something that happened four hours ago. So it's the pairing of an aversive feeling in the body with the um, value that existed four hours ago, but now persist in memory. So it's all about having a memory that you can use to decide whether the current, stim the current uh, stimulus is valuable to you or not. Okay. So that's the difference between habits and goal-directed behavior. So all mammals can do that, but it's not clear that other uh, vertebrates can, except birds. Now, birds and mammals can do a lot of very sophisticated things. And it's been, you know, the question is why birds and mammals? What's the, the connection? Well, it turns out that, you know, birds and mammals are the only two kinds of organisms, to only two animals, that are warm-blooded. Well, why does that matter? Okay. Well, if you're warm-blooded, that means you've got a you know an oven in you that is keeping your body warm 24/7, maintaining a body temperature. Now, this you know bees and some other things can have some kind of temporary warm-bloodedness, but it's not the same thing at all. So, 
to do that, you need a, a heck of a lot of food to keep the engine going. You can't, you can't let that engine go down. Um, it's got to stay hot to maintain that constant temperature. So birds and mammals have to forage for food and they have to be very careful of how they do it. So they have to have some sense of the season. You know, you can't go to the place where the, you got the food in the summer in the middle of the winter because it's going to be too hard and uh, it's probably not going to be there anyway. So you have to like shop for food today based on the weather today and your or your anticipation of the weather that you can have some sense of that you know the weather is going to change so you got to do it quickly or wait till a little while lots of decisions can be made that are that are very important um but if you don't if you don't plan properly uh if you screw it up then you know you're not going to have food and so you won't be able to maintain that that warm bloodedness so it's all about warm bloodedness being the reason that planning exists because you you have to be able to plan complex ways and be very efficient in your foraging at least that's the the idea behind why they might be both uh, warm blooded yeah so that uh, that takes us into the the cognitive realm and uh, takes us further into the cognitive realm and and how all that works so you know I, Again, I like to talk about the cognitive realm in terms of these mental models and this internal representation of a reinforcer is a good example of a mental model. These mental models are not necessarily conscious. Um, we don't know, you know, what kind of consciousness, if any other animals besides us have, but I'm willing to say they likely have something similar uh, to at least some kinds of consciousness we have. Um, so maybe we should then jump to the conscious realm.